We're going to try and stay on time here. Uh, welcome back. I guarantee you we have the antidote for the post-lunch drip. You know, you get tired after all that wonderful food. We have a plenary session here with three leading lights in the GI science community. Um, so I'm guaranteeing you, you will stay awake for um, these three talks. We saw two of the speakers in the panel yesterday, which was very stimulating. And Piotr is the third speaker, and I've been a longtime colleague of Piotr, so I'll guarantee you that this will be excellent. Our first speaker is Mark Hagen from the University of Auckland, who's going to tell us about the end of geographic theory. Right, it's a frightening title, isn't it? I apologize for frightening people. But I thought it might grab, grab someone's attention. Now, recently, you may have read it, some pundits, even some respectable scientists, have mooted this idea of the end of theory. Has anyone heard of that idea? Sort of fourth paradigm idea? That if you have enough data, you won't need theory at all, because we can learn all the theory we need via inductive learning from the data. But then learning of theory is a very complicated task. So is it even possible to learn geographical theory from data? Now, of course, we as humans can do this. We learn all of our theory from, well, most of our theory from observations. I think probably the exception is Einstein there, um, who, who didn't make any observations but still came up with theory. Um, for those of you who are confused by that opening slide, of course, it is a joke. Einstein never suggested our science should be data-led. But many other luminaries have. And what I wanted to explore with you for a few minutes is what are the prospects for geographical theory that is discovered computationally? This might seem like a, a lofty goal or perhaps a frightening goal, but it's a, a long-standing goal. It's been the holy grail of analytics and deep AI for the last 40 years. To have analytical models that can explain their own reasoning. Um, how many of you have read David Harvey's excellent 1969 book, Explanation in Geography? Right. Which takes you on a tour of all of the conceptual and practical aspects of geographic analysis, right through from the theory of how we build models, uh, conceptual models, uh, and how we do science, right through to the practice of analysis, and then how all of that connects together to make explanations. Well, if you could imagine taking David Harvey's book and implementing it, basically that's what this talk is trying to suggest. Now, a couple of my other heroes, uh, Peter Gould was one of my heroes, and he always used to refer to the computer as a high-speed idiot. And he did that to make it really clear that the computer knew nothing and the geographer knew everything. So the emphasis was on the geographer to get everything right, and the computer was just an idiot that could do things quickly for the geographer. Contrast that with Stan Openshaw, another of my heroes, who um, built a machine called the Geographical Explanation Machine in 1998. I think he published the paper. It wasn't really an explanation machine, but what it did was find associations between layers in a GIS. And then it invited you to suggest what the linking factors might be based on those associations. So correlation is not causation, it was not explanation that he actually found. But it's a very interesting model nonetheless. Uh, the, the aim was to try and aid the researcher to discover new things and to understand them. Now there's a branch of computational informatics called computational model discovery or discovery informatics. It's fairly new. Um, it's really only come to the fore in the last three to five years. And I've been looking at that recently and wondering what it takes to bring their efforts into the ge geography or the GI science regime. So that's what I'm really going to be talking about today, about computational model discovery. Just before we go any further, recap that there are two kinds of analytical models. Now, you probably know there are two kinds of people, too. Those who like to put people into categories and those who don't. But there are two kinds of analytical models. You probably remember this. There are predictive models that are really good at telling you what the answer will be. And there are descriptive models that help you understand how the model works. And um, both of those models have a place. Um, 
But we're aiming here for descriptive models, models that are based on theory, models that are traceable back to theory. In what way is this new? Well, you probably know that we have data mining and knowledge discovery and, and ordinary machine learning. We've had those for quite a long time. And, and as Serge point, pointed out uh, in his talk yesterday, data mining and machine learning have a bad rap with what you might call the theory fundamentalists because they make inferences in the absence of theory. And some people don't like that. So computational model discovery is not about data mining or knowledge discovery in the way we typically understand them because those systems are good at predicting things but they're not good at describing how those things relate back to theory. In fact, they describe things in the language of statistics or in the language of equations or in the language of patterns, but they don't describe things in the language of a geographer. Computational model discovery tries to do that. It focuses on, on interpretability of models by humans, and we're interested in explanations that connect observations to theory or theory to observations through methods and a model of the process of science. So we've been learning from data forever. It's not a new idea. But connecting that learning to theory is, an, is not a new challenge either, but it's a hard challenge that we're only just beginning to make some traction on. Those of you who remember reading Harvey's book, uh, and I reread it again recently, I think it's a really excellent book. It works through the various steps of problem solving and, and explanation in geography, as I said earlier. It, it examines those various stages and shows how they connect together. So he moves through methodological frameworks and the nature of investigation, and philosophy and the nature of the science process or the investigation process, and its various conceptual artifacts, including things like ontology. And then he looks at representation, the data structures and domain models that we might use, and how they are derived from these methodological frameworks and philosophy. And then on top of that, he shows how analytical tools interact with this various stack here. And from that, tries to show us how we can work back through uh, analysis, through to representation, philosophy, and methodology, to provide a full explanation of the results we've got, couched in all the right layers of theory to support them. So this theory here is essentially a model for the science process, these two first bullet points here. And this is needed to constrain the kinds of analytical models that we allow to exist and how these models can relate to each other. Without this theory, the problem of constraining how the models might be built is too great. This part here, the representation, we might think of as a domain model or a data model in this sort of old parlance. This part here is our scientific process model or our workflow or our computer code. And at the bottom are our explanation. So what Harvey is showing really is how theory, domain models, and scientific process models all fit together or could fit together. Now the question is, can they fit together computationally? There has been some work, as I said before, on inductive, lear on inductive learning of process models. In this case, a process is based on a, on, a, on a collection of related functions, which can be dif differential, or they can be algebraic, uh, or could be just a single equation, just a process that you're familiar with, like working out a Manhattan distance, for example. These processes can have unobserved variables in them, and they specify causal relationships between one or more output variables. So what we're trying to do is to create a system that from data can actually learn a model that describes the data, the interactions in the data. So we're trying to translate the mathematical model to a set of rules and relationships between data artifacts that are grounded in theory. A tall order. Some of the work that's been done in computational model discovery has been in uh, ecology. Some has also been in cellular biology. And so if we take a, a common model in ecology, the one people always start with when they're modeling, a predator-prey relationship, then it is possible to show that given enough 
uh, useful processes described beforehand, then the system can learn the way of combining those processes to form a model that describes the predator-prey relationship. So what's being fed in here is some theory about how all the pieces of the models can fit together, data uh, about the predator and the prey uh, and their prevalence, and then also some, some primitive functions that the system then learns how to assemble together. So the input is time series data, the knowledge domain, and processes and constraints. And then there's a search for ways of connecting those processes, those functions together to mimic the process. But they're grounded back into the theory again. And then there's also a second step where we instantiate parameters over those methods or those uh, functions too to tune the fit. So it's a two-stage learning process. It's incredibly computationally intensive. And if you got this far, now I can say, and this is why it's an important cyber GIS topic, because the computational power needed to do this kind of discovery is, is huge. And also, the, the team that you need to, to bring together, who can give you the information that you might require on the right processes and the right data models or domain models and the right theories about how all, they, all those things connect together, that's a, that's a task for a community, not for an individual. And where process modeling has been successful so far, it's been with quite large teams of researchers working together in a multidisciplinary se setting. So we need the computing power, and we need the expertise that's in this room. Oh, and this output too, of course. So what I've done here is combine some of uh, Harvey's ideas with some of Bridewell's ideas. And Bridewell's one of the leading lights in this, uh, in this area of computational model discovery. So what I've done is kind of make a, um, a, a sort of a set of constraints that need to be satisfied before this can work. Uh, and some of these are from Harvey and some of these are from Bridewell. The, the darker ones are from Bridewell, the blue ones are from Harvey. So we need a methodology for research and a meta model that describes the process of research or the process of science. There could be many models that do that, we just need one. And then we need a set of representational forms for the observations, that is uh, a, uh, a domain model. And then we need the data themselves, we need ontologies to tell us about categories and constraints uh, among instances. And then we need the processes, the methods, the functions that many people have talked about already today. And some constraints to indicate plausible relations and implausible ones, more importantly, and then our job is to find a process model and the associated parameterization that not only predicts the observed values, but also explains them. That's what we're trying to do. Here's an example of one not from the geographical community. Uh, I, I mentioned this at the UCGIS meeting uh, earlier in the year, so apologies for those who heard it before. Uh, there's a, a bench robot called Eve. Eve is a... Uh, a robot that does drug discovery. You may have seen those little robots on some of the sci-fi movies. They put little drops of liquid in, in test tubes automatically and then send them to be assayed or to have some kind of spectral analysis performed on them. Well, Eve's one of those robots, but coupled to it is a knowledge base and a model of the science process and constraints that describe what is already known in that community and what things are not known yet. And Eve, this robot, has actually made some discoveries. And, interestingly, those discoveries have been published. And then, sadly, um, rather unfairly, I think, Eve herself is not an author on any of those discovery publications, uh, which brings up a really interesting ethical question, I think, that we might want to consider in about 20 years' time when we've figured out how to do this. But we have now uh, bench robots that have sophisticated models of discovery in the sciences that can learn things about potential drugs uh, based on their biochemistry that are not known before. There is also a sort of halfway example in the earth sciences too. Um, the GOES early fire detection system, some of you may have heard of this, um, it's been operating over Southern California. 
uh, and it has quite sophisticated models to assess near real-time imagery every 20 minutes, and um, it has workflows for both for the training stage, for pre-processing, and for detection of fires, wildfires. And this is the detection stage here. And it actually has discovered many fire incidents uh, before people have. In fact, it, it, it routinely outperforms fire spotters now because, of course, it has better coverage. It can't yet discover new models of, of how fires might be uncovered in data, but it has almost everything that's required to allow it to learn those things, including within it the set of all the methods that are used in the pre-processing and the training stage. So it's almost a complete system that it have, if it had a, a computational model learning engine on the top of it, would actually be a, the first example in, in, a, in a field related to ours. So it is possible. So how close are we in the GI sciences to discovering process models? Well, let's have a look at those major components, those key pieces that Harvey and Bridewell identified and see how close we are. Firstly, do we have good domain models? Well, the answer is clearly yes. We have some really good domain models. Some of them have semantics. Here's the domain model from one geology expressed in GeoSciML. There are others. The water ML is a really nice model. And there are several others that I'm sure you would be aware of, the OGC Simple Feature Model, for example, that give a, a quite reasonable domain model for us to start from. Do we have lists of analytical functions? Well, I borrowed this slide from, uh, from our chair over there because he showed it yesterday, Serge. This is the PyCell family of analytical functions. So yes, of course we have that kind of thing. Um, you may not want these kinds of analytical functions. You might want really simple ones. Um, distance metrics, for example. You might want the family of methods from Donna Tomlin's uh, um, map algebra that we heard uh, just a few minutes before lunch. Any library of functions will do, provided they can be related back to theory. Um, and, and we'll come to that in a moment. So do we have models for the process of scientific investigation using these uh, domain data models and these, uh, these libraries of functions? And I think the answer is probably, maybe not, perhaps a little bit. There's some work, I've done some work in this area, others have too, trying to create models of the science process. Pat Langley and colleagues have done some quite excellent work in this area, which they've proved to work in the area of biochemistry. Boyne Broderick's created a language called SKI, the Science Knowledge Integration Ontology, which is another roadmap for how science might work. This is just one possible model for how science might work, to which methods can actually be connected. So you know which methods can move you to and from which points on a model like this. This is what you need in order to be able to use those methods in a way so that later you can explain them by theory. Does that make sense? So if you know how the, the the methods take you from step to step in a model of the science process, then you can use that model of the science process to reason about what it is that the methods are doing, or the other way around, to constrain how the methods can be used. So here's my cyber GIS grand challenge for you. Create a geographical process model discovery system that integrates a model of discovery science, a domain or data model, some analysis software, and some data, and some constraints. And I think in the next two or three years, this community could do that. I'd love to be a part of it. Um, but I think it's something we could do. We have the expertise, we have the computational power, we have the tools. It would be great to be one of the early adopters of this kind of um, new branch of, of artificial intelligence. Um, rather than one of the later doctors. So let's do it before the geophysicists do it, for example. Or the historians, if we're to, to believe what Mike was saying earlier. They might, they might get there before we do. So just to end with, are there limits of what we can uh, infer from da data? Of course there are. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that our learned models might not be useful. They might tell us what we don't know, or they might tell us better what we thought we knew. And this has been the case 
in some of the test areas where these tools have been tried, they have found things that researchers didn't know or suggested metabolic pathways in biochemistry uh, that, that were probably better at explaining the data than the ones that have been proposed by existing theory. And yet they could explain their behavior via theory. So they were useful in taking theory forward. Are there limits? Yes, of course there are. The model is at best as good as the data. But this might still be better than current theory. So just because it won't work perfectly doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Our own theories are not perfect either. And another qualification, yes, this is more hopeful. As data becomes more ubiquitous, then these limits will retreat. Now, this is the case uh, that I alluded to right at the beginning where some people are saying, we won't need theory anymore. What they mean by that is that we won't need theorists anymore because we can discover the theory. If you think about that for a moment, it's just quite a scary prospect. But what that means is, if I can be rude for a moment, we won't need physical geographers or human geographers. We'll need GI scientists who can build all of this technology. The theory will be learned by the machines. Now, that, of course, is overstating the case radically. And I, I do that just to be uh, a little bit um, provocative. But these kinds of tools, when they are enabled with carefully constructed science methods and methodologies, I think will be able to take us into areas of discovery between disciplines and cross-disciplinary areas using new and emerging data sets in very helpful and timely ways. And so that's my hope, and thank you for listening. We have time for questions. Shall we? Very enlightening, Mark. Um, enjoyed it. Uh, example of geographical discovery could get this demonstrated. Could I give you an example of, the yeah. dis of discovery? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, let's imagine that we have a database of uh, health records, and we have, let's do the Stan Openshaw example, right? Let's, let's do uh, health records and nuclear power stations. Now, this is a controversial one, because I think Stan got it wrong when he proposed that uh, um, child leukemia was actually related to the positions of nuclear power stations. But in, in essence, one could propose a hypothesis by which the environment was affecting human health. And with enough constraints in there and enough theory in there, that hypothesis might be a viable one. So one might be able to hypothesize something about the uh, prevalence of lung cancer in the eastern United States, which is a well-known but problematic spatial epidemiological trend that people think is perhaps related to climate and perhaps related to humidity and perhaps related to mold, or maybe it's radon gas. No one's really sure what the causal mechanisms are. And to actually iterate through and test many hundreds or thousands of causal mechanisms would be limiting for most humans. But in a system like this, there's no reason why the, the system can't come up with 20 or so possible explanatory models that could narrow down your search. So that's really what it's about. Xuan? So uh, I was curious if you could uh, explain the difference between the model and the theory. Because it seems to me that you sort of equate both, equate model to the theory. Oh, right. Well, yeah, they're all very o overloaded terms, aren't there? And there are at least two kinds of models that I was talking about today. One was an analytical model, which is a bunch of methods or functions. And one was a data model that describes uh, how a domain fits together, entity relationship diagrams or UML diagrams or ontology, that kind of thing. And of course, there's model in the greater sense, which is a theoretical model that, that describes how a researcher might go about doing a piece of research. Um, so I've tried not to use the word model here to describe that theory, uh, the greater theory, the meta model of how science works, because it would get too confusing. But what I mean by theory, in this case, is a theory of how the process of science connects with the artifacts of science to produce some outcome. Is that okay? Okay. 
uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Mark. Okay, our second plenary speaker today is Piotr Jankowska. We're going to report on some co collaborative work with Erika Lingman Zelinska. Piotr. Thank you, Serge. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Well, after this excellent and inspiring talk by Mark about theory and uh, implications of uh, uh, how we can look at theory, I'm going to come down to a level of methods. Uh, so, my talk is about. Uh, spatio-temporal approach to uncertainty and sensitivity analysis, and I titled it broadly in geographical models. I'll give one example of a model uh, from that class of models, and I'd like to acknowledge my uh, co-author, Arika Ligman-Zielinska from Michigan State University, who's not here with us. It's not really what I'm getting. Down. Let's see. This one? Well, that's the end of my talk. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Let's just test it. Okay. This works. A brief definition. Uh, so, uh, I'm talking about two uh, beasts which seem to be uh, dissimilar, but I will argue that they are intertwined. And the, uns the only sensible way to talk about uncertainty is when you combine it with sensitivity analysis. Uh, uncertainty analysis, uh, that's where we uh, try to assess uh, what really causes uh, model output to uh, behave in a certain way. So we look at the uncertainty of model output as a function of inputs. And these inputs may be of uh, different kinds. These may be model parameters, these may be model variables. Uh, there can be even uncertainty about processes that we capture in a model. Uh, so there are various kinds of uncertainties involved. I'm going to stay at a level of uh, parameter. And then there's sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis looks at uh, what, on the side of inputs, uh, contributes to that uncertainty that we observe in model output. So in a way, uh, looking at these two combined, we have a circular approach. We have a sort of like a feedback loop. And uh, the first pass, or first half of the loop, takes us from model inputs. Uh, we employ Monte Carlo simulation, which is the usual approach to capture uh, different uh, uh, possible values of model inputs. And then at the end of this, we obtain model results. Now, uh, we average over many, many runs of model through Monte Carlo process, so we get some mean response. And then we can measure a variance of that mean, which gives us uh, uncertainty. And so that's the what I call a, a forward chaining pass from inputs through a model that is simulated many times for various values of models, which are randomly sampled, uh, to model output and some mean uh, uh, result of that output and the variance. And then there is a, what I call a backward chaining pass, which takes us from model output. Uh, and here we employ uh, a method of variance decomposition. 
through decomposing variants of that model output, which is an uncertainty, we can then trace back to input conditions and pinpoint which of those inputs are responsible for that uncertainty that we observe in model output. So that's the idea behind uh, uh, what I call an integrated approach to uncertainty and uh, sensitivity analysis. Uh, now, why do we do this? What's the motivation? What's the payoff from that approach? Well, I see at least four different areas of payoff, and that's why this approach uh, is interesting to me. Uh, number one, uh, we can manage uh, model output uncertainty, and we can do this through identifying specific factors that contribute to uh, output variance. Now, not only we can do that, but then we can uh, sort of backtrack and uh, play a little bit with these factors so that uh, we can narrow the ranges, let's say, of model parameters, or even pinpoint specific values which will minimize output variance. So we can, in a way, model that uncertainty that we observe. Second, uh, uh, we can identify those input factors which are non-influential. They're not really responsible uh, uh, for that um, uncertainty in the model output. And then we can deal with those by fixing their values to a constant, uh, or in some instances, even removing them from a model, making a model more parsimonious, simplifying a model. So that's another uh, incentive for doing this. Thirdly, uh, we can discover which of those uh, input factors which are burdened by uncertainty, that's at least what we, we hypothesize, interact, and we can uncover that interaction. So we can learn a bit more about the behavior of, of, of a model. And uh, also, finally, uh, based on that decomposition of a var variance, we can uh, pinpoint which of our inputs may benefit from better higher quality data in a sense of also reducing the model va va variance. Uh, let me enumerate quickly the steps of this approach. Uh, initially, we identify which of the input factors are burdened by uncertainty. Sometimes this, this is easy, the usual suspect, sometimes this is m more difficult. Next, we uh, sample from probability distribution functions of those input factors providing we have those functions. In a uh, default case, we can use uniform probability distribution functions and, sample, uh, and samples of their values. Um, in the next step, we uh, simulate our model uh, n times for that number of entries in our sample. And then we aggregate uh, the results of those simulations by computing mean uh, value of an output and variance, which is a measure of our uncertainty. And that was, that, that, uh, that is a step of uncertainty analysis. In the step of sensitivity analysis, or a phase of sensitivity analysis, we uh, compute a total variance of our model output. This is called unconditional variance because it combines the, in the, the influence on a variance of specific individual components, parameters of a model taken singly, and uh, interactions among those parameters. That's why we call it un unconditional or total variance. We decompose it into uh, uh, two, uh, uh, two kinds of measures, or we obtain a result of decomposition two kinds of measures. First order sensitivity indices, and they quantify uh, contribution two output variants of individual uh, factors taken singly, not interacting with other factors. And then so-called total sensitivity index, which accounts for the interactions. Uh, let me uh, bring up now an example uh, which illustrates this approach. We are interested in modeling uh, suitable areas for reintroducing or uh, expanding the ecological range of a rare plant called the uh, checker mellow. You see this flower on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, this flower can be found on the eastern slopes of, Casca of the Cascade Mountains in Washington State. And so we are looking specifically in one county, Chelan County, and more specifically at the 
an area in the southern portion of the county. Uh, our model is a fairly simple uh, multiple criteria evaluation model that can be used to find suitable locations for uh, reintroducing the plant or expanding the range of the plant. We use uh, ideal point uh, aggregation function, one of many functions that can be used in these types of models. We have seven suitability criteria. You see uh, them here, the soil suitability, uh, density of coniferous uh, forest canopy, rainfall, distance to developed areas, solar radiation, elevation, and stream density. Uh, these criteria have uh, weights, which represent the relative importance of the, uh, of the criteria. The weights are uncertain input factors. Even though the weights are specified by uh, experts in the area, uh, in, in this uh, study area, they are uncertain. So we treat them as uncertain factors. And then what do we do in the, in the following that uh, process of uh, integrated uncertainty sensitivity analysis, we sample weights from, in this instance, uniform probability distribution functions. We uh, take many thousands of weight values from that PDF ranges. Uh, and then we run the model that many times. And in the result, we take mean value uh, for each location. As you can tell, this is based on a raster uh, data model, so we have pixels or cells as locations. Now here is the result of this. Uh, on the upper left, you have the average suitability map, and the scheme, color scheme is very simple here. The red values represent high suitability uh, values for each pixel, and light yellow values represent relatively low suitability values. Uh, on the right, uh, next to it, you see uncertainty map. Now, here uncertainty is represented by standard deviation of the mean. Uh, well, of course, there, there is uh, this distribution of areas of high uncertainty. They do not necessarily overlap with the areas of high suitability. Uh, and then, uh, looking at, that, uh, at these two histograms of average suitability and uncertainty, we can... Uh, well, this is arguable, uh, but we can decide on a cutoff value. And in, in the instance of the average suitability, that's 45 on a scale from zero suitability to 100 suitability. That's the highest theoretical value of the suitability. The value of 45 uh, is chosen as a cutoff value for high suitability. Anything 45 and higher is deemed to be highly suitable. Below that is has low suitability. Now, uh, in a, uh, in a, uh, for this standard deviation map, this value is 10. So anything that uh, has a value of 10 of standard deviation on that scale 0 to 10 is considered to uh, be highly uncertain. Anything below that is, uh, has acceptable level of, un of uncertainty. And then what we do uh, we, is we uh, uh, focus on the, these areas, and we divide them into four simple categories. The green uh, areas represent those that are highly suitable and have acceptably low level of uncertainty. Now, these are clear winners. These are the areas that we don't have to worry about. But what if there is not enough land? What if the total acreage represented by green areas is not enough for introducing our plant. Well, then we go to the next best category, and these are red areas, having high suitability and high uncertainty, so-called high-high. These are candidate regions, and on the right, they are uh, zoomed on, and we are focusing on four different uh, clusters of those areas, A, B, C, and D. Clearly, these are the areas of high-high, where high-high dominates. So this is where conventional uncertainty analysis stops. This is what you can get out of uncertainty analysis, not much more than that. But the question then becomes, what causes 
this uh, high uncertainty in highly suitable areas, A, B, C, and D. Is there any specific weight or a subgroup, a subset of weights that by interacting or singly are responsible for the, this high uncertainty? Now, the answer to this question can be found by completing our loop and stepping through sensitivity analysis. And here is the result of spatially explicit sensitivity analysis. Now, we use a global sensitivity approach. Conventionally, uh, uh, these uh, first order and total order indices are computed as, as scalar values. You get one value per factor. What we do here, we uh, provide spatially distributed sensitivity indices. And there are some interesting patterns that emerge. So uh, for uh, mm, density of coniferous forest canopy, for example, if you remember uh, locations of our areas, high, high, high uncertainty and high suitability, there is a overlap that you can discern by looking at the pattern here. Uh, down there, you have a scale of these first order sensitivity uh, indices. So in this instance, they range from zero, meaning there are certain areas uh, within that larger study area where this specific weight for that specific criterion is totally inconsequential. Does not really explain uh, the variability of our output, the variance of standard deviation of our output. But then there are areas where th this very weight explains uh, in 85% the variability. And that can be said about uh, any of those, except that, of course, you have dis different distributions. Now, they can be combined, and we do that by producing a dominance map of these sensitivity indices. And looking again at these four selected areas, A, B, C, and D, uh, you can quickly t see which of the the weights are mostly responsible for that uncertainty. Well, there are green uh, areas. This is uh, coniferous forest tree canopy and gray areas. This is elevation suitability. With a little uh, uh, instance of uh, distance to development, these are brown pixels and stream density. These are uh, blue pixels. This analysis then can be followed uh, looking at uh, to what extent the interaction among these weights explains our uncertainty. And we do this by computing uh, these total sen sensitivity indices. Turns out that in this specific situation, the pattern is very similar to uh, individual sensitivity indices. So uh, the amount of the uncertainty uh, and uh, that uncertainty that plays out spatially is explained roughly in the same way by individual weights and by these weights interacting with each other. So what do we take out of this analysis? Well, uh, what do we take out of it is that, number one, we know that uh, there are two, primarily two weights of two criteria, density of forest canopy and uh, elevation that are largely responsible for uh, high uncertainty in areas that we are interested in. Uh, so what we can do then, we can backtrack and by some clever computations, we, we can pinpoint narrow ranges of these weights or even specific values of those weights and then present them to our experts and ask them, uh, would you agree to uh, narrow uh, the range of your weights to this that we presented to you or even to go with that specific weight of value? So we can suggest cer certain values of those weights which will minimize the uncertainty in the output of the model, which will minimize the standard deviation. Uh, we can also uh, fix the uh, weights of the remaining uh, three criteria. Uh, we have here four represented on the right hand side out of seven, which means we uh, are in a way simplifying our model. We only worry about four of those. We can also go and acquire better quality data for our forest uh, for the tree canopy and for our elevation and in hope that this will also reduce the uncertainty in the model. So uh, this result gives us certain pathways to uh, uh, minimize the uncertainty of the model output. Now, here's where this becomes interesting for uh, cyber GIS. In this approach, uh, 
we, in order to uh, compute these sensitivity indices, and in order, order to deal with a problem which I did not address of convergence of the values of these sensitivity indices, we need to draw big samples. In this very example, our n number of uh, weight values is 15,360. And again, I'm skipping uh, explanation why is it so. That is a function of a cer certain sampling scheme that we are using. Uh, K is relatively small, seven uh, criterion weights plus two. That plus two, again, is a function of our sampling scheme. Uh, so uh, that seven plus two times 15,360 gives us 138,240 samples. Uh, now, uh, given the fact that this model will be run uh, as many times as there are spatial units uh, in our study area, meaning as many cells there are, that's 73,170 cells. And that's not a big raster by any means. So here you have the count. It's that 73,000 by 130,000. It's about, it's over 10 to the power of 9 runs of a model. Uh, now, this becomes even more confounded if uh, we take into fact account the fact that we can have more than 7 plus 2 uh, uncertain input factors, so that k plus 2 may be potentially larger, and uh, uh, that we can have a temporal model, a spatio-temporal model, where we, we are going to run it over t time instances. And that's where it becomes really computationally complex and challenging. So I'm going to finish this with the conclusion that uh, this unified approach of spatially explicit uncertainty and sensitivity uh, analysis has merit, definitely, in terms of uh, mm, uh, improving modeling results or uh, potentially reducing uncertainty or explaining uncertainty on our models. Uh, secondly, um, the complexity of these models, it's an obvious function of uh, space representation and time, um, and there is an obvious increase as this accuracy of representation in space and time uh, increases. And thirdly, uh, this is, a, in my mind, a pr prime problem for cyber uh, uh, GIS, cyber infrastructure, and the next step is really to devise intelligent ways of representing uncertain inputs and taking advantage of high-performance computing environments. Thank you. We have time for maybe two questions. Yes. Um, thank you for your uh, very interesting talk. So uh, I'm actually curious about uh, how do you derive the source of uncertainty in your spatial data because we know that uh, some for some spatial data, they have some like, what we say, errors or certainties in some spatial pat patterns. When you do the simulation, actually the sensitivity result is highly uh, dependent on how you quantify your uncertainty, like the range or the distributions. So I'm just wondering, do you just uh, do some randomized sampling from your spatial result, or you try to do some geostatistic analysis to quantify those uh, uncertainties? Thank you. Sure. Well, you touched upon uh, uh, something that I've been pondering on <laughs> very recently, because this is the next step in taking this approach. Uh, and this is really scaling or increasing the number of uncertain inputs. In this example, uh, there is a fairly small number of uncertain w inputs uh, represented by these weights. But what if in uh, these input layers we had areas of uncertainty? What if in each of these layers we had uh, 1,000 cells that are burdened by potential uncertainty? Well, in that case, the problem becomes really challenging. And uh, trying to uh, run this approach through that many uncertain inputs becomes almost computationally infeasible. So uh, this is my last bullet in the conclusion. We need some intelligent ways of uh, aggregating, representing, uh, uh, selecting representative uh, spatial features that are uncertain. One more question? 
Okay, thanks, Piotr. Okay, the final plenary in this session is by May Wan, University of Texas, which is bigger than Oklahoma, right? Much bigger. <laughs> I tell us. And the talk thank is on space-time, spatial narratives, and cyber GIS. Well, thank you, Sergio. Well, thank you very much for another opportunity here. And actually, after here, uh, the uncertainty, I feel really uncertain. I want to make a ch quick change here. <laughs> uh, here we go. All right. Hopefully, my degree of uncertainty decreases. All right, so uh, what I want to talk about is uh, space-time in GIS and how can we tra transfer space-time into spatial narratives and how that fit into the overall cyber GIS uh, concept. And uh, the research team is myself and John McIntosh and Grant DeLoser. And the project is ended, so John have joined the city of Norman and Grant Loser, he is now in University of Texas in Austin in the linguistics department. So uh, um, this is, the project is funded by the National Science Foundation. It's a cyber-enabled discovery and innovation. And the, uh, I just say that whatever I say here is all my responsibility. Uh, do not reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And uh, uh, the more detail of uh, description of the project is impressed uh, by the Indiana University. Oh, I actually spelled it wrong. <laughs> As a GIS a narrative generation platform. And this project is a, in collaboration with historians, just like what might say this morning, uh, humanitist, uh, humanitists, they really want to publish books rather than uh, referee publications in a journal. So this pretty much fit into that tradition. Uh, it's in, in a book. And the book is called Deep Maps and Spatial Narratives. And most of the ideas is uh, iterative between uh, the historians and, and GIS people like myself. So the premises here is that uh, what I emphasize here is what cyber enable us to know something that w we will not have known before. So taking advantage of the cyber resources and then to uh, extract the information from the web and across the platform and then produce summaries in the GIS platform. So GIS is really a, a, a utility or a facilitators to get new information out of what is distributed on the web. And here, I really do not differentiate cyber GIS from web GIS or from cloud GIS. So eventually, what I'm looking at is there's somewhere out there in the cyber infrastructure through web, through clouds, and then how can we grab those information and make sense of it? And then the information I'm using is uh, text, uh, different from uh, previous uh, presentation. Their data are numerical in nature. And the, da the data I'm working on is text data. And I'm a physical geographer uh, at the beginning, so this is a new territory, territory for me as well. But as I get into this, I learned that text is the primary form of communication and recording human knowledge. And there are a lot of digital uh, text exposed in the uh, web, and like news reports, digital books, web pages, and social medias. And from those texts, and I'm hoping to extract facts, events, and narratives in space and time, try to answer who is there, what is going on there, where things happen, when it's happened, and how things happen. 
So we know that Google Trends, then this have been done somewhere already. Uh, Google Trend can look at the frequency of words and then to look at the uh, histogram to know how popular a particular topic is. But I feel this is pretty, very unsettled because what we can gain is that uh, how a term, a terminology, uh, in this case, Syria war and Syria revolution, change over time through uh, people enter the keyword in the Google search. So they can tell us that people are interested in the topic, but really do not tell us why they are interested and why the, the variabilities on those frequencies over time. And I'm really bad with, with history. And in, in fact, in my high school years, history is my worst subject area. I always get the lowest uh, score in my exam. Uh, of course, I can blame that Chinese history is just too long. And I only have very short-term memory. But I found that when we look at a lot of uh, interesting books, novels, in this case, Law of Ring, and it, it, oh, it, it's fiction history. But for me, when I read through those novels, I want to draw a map to show me that where things happened and how flotos and move from the villages all the way to the evil mountains and how the fellows uh, you know, depart and how they take different routes. And for me, this makes so much more sense and then I can remember much better rather than read through the text so without a mental map that I draw it uh, as I read it. And I found that, in fact, a lot of people have similar uh, idea that when they read through a story, they want to draw out the story. So why can we develop a GIS tools and functions that automatically draw out the stories for, for people when they read through the text? So that's basically the idea of this project. And to draw out the story, we need to find out that if there are any kind of a theory or conceptual framework that we can rely upon to, to, uh, for the whole process. And I, I went through a, a lot of literatures and I found that narrative intelligence literature seems to be uh, able to provide me at least some foundations to go about. And it mentioned that there are three elements in the narrative formation. You have fabula uh, as an event. It's the raw chronological events we can extract from the text. And then we put those events in a structure to form stories and then give meanings to the stories and then form narratives. So this will be the raw map that our conceptual framework I'm working on when I try to do that. So for spatial narratives that I make a very simple definition, start with atomic event. I want to extract actors actions, location, and time of that actions occurred follow up, follow along this uh, particular actor. And then so I can temporarily order those events and then to put those temporal order in a spatial context and then build connections over space and time. And, and then so I will form the spatial narratives and then I can identify singularities, how the narrative depart from all other narratives and how to interpret the con contingency causes that one, if one narrative is a precursor of other narratives. And how do we, uh, and, and then we can not gen generate one narrative because a, a common set of events depends on our perspective. We might form different narratives through the selection process. And then eventually what I, my definition of spatial narratives is a spatially situated sequences of events in a story structure in space and time that command meanings and effects. Okay, so computationally is really uh, just try to implement the idea, try to extract events and then sequence events in, in, in an a array that form the narratives. And how do I extract events from the text? And a text, I see there are two different elements. One is state, to lay out the stage or scenarios, and then have events happen in that stage or on, in that scenario. So what I'm looking at in the text, there are static verbs and dynamic verbs. 
So if I see a dynamic verb, I will consider there is an event occurred. If there is a static verb, I will interpret that as to lay out the stage or lay out the state. And then I would think that for, for a given state, we might have multiple events occur in that state. And for a given event, I might have multiple states that the event can occur. So event and state uh, relationship is many to many. And for the event to narrative, they might have uh, events that can participate in multiple narratives, or a narratives can contain multiple events. So that relationship is many to many again. And then for particular articles, you might have multiple narratives. And so that's uh, many to one relationship. So the idea behind it is that if the triangle represents an article, an article has multiple narratives, and multi uh, narratives have multiple events, and multiple events can be with multiple states. And if we have a lot of articles on the web, and individually it will be difficult to really cross-reference that how the events occurred uh, uh, in context of other events or in context of other states. And those, those disparate events and narrative across articles can we combine it into the GIS platform. So if we can combine it in the GIS platform, we can order events over time. We can order events based on the actors that committed those actions in those events, or we can integrate events uh, uh, in space, so that throughout the time, space, and actor, then we can build narratives uh, in different ways, and that provide much richer interpretation or understanding of the his historical document. So the experiment I did is uh, two, historic, two types of historical document and this is an example of what we call dias companions, and it is the uh, document that uh, record all the Union true movements during the Civil War period. And this is uh, just a one excerpt to see the 100 Illinois Regiment Infantry. And another document I'm looking at, another set of document, is a newspaper document is a Richmond Dispatch a newspaper that published during the Civil War. So why are I looking at these two type of documents? Uh, remember, I'm working with historians, and they, they are interested in the emancipation uh, process. And there were two arguments that in how the emancipation occurred. And the most of people think that is Lincoln took the leadership, advocated and, uh, the emancipation uh, of free slaves. But there is another argument that the emancipation is really a grassroots activities, that a lot of slaves uh, escape from plantation and, and then putting, uh, have a lot of activities occur at the local level. And Lincoln, when when the country is having a lot of argument and the Lincoln used the emancipation free slaves as the uh, 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 a topic to hold the nation together. But uh, when, when we get started on the project, we were not thinking about looking at the controversies of emancipation. Um, but as the project progressed, that a lot of historians asked other questions that uh, really in the interactive process that they recognize something they didn't know before and becoming very interesting research topic for them to further investigate. And I used two separate independent sources um, because I think that I want to demonstrate that GIS as a narrative generation platform allow us to put multiple resources together to see the con controversy or uh, correlation between uh, writings in different uh, sources. But also, um, the, the newspaper article talk about what happened in the society. And the other uh, dais compendium talk about how the true movement. 
So that's more from the government military uh, perspective. So the idea is that if we see a lot of uh, slaves activity report uh, have spatial and temporal correlation to the true movement, the, the Union Army winning the battle, and, and then before the Gettysburg speech by Lincoln, then that can support the other argument that the uh, grassroots activities have a, a, a very important, play an important role in the overall emancipation movement. But put that aside, I, today I just want to look at the technical side of the, uh, the, the project. So what we did is that we put a historical document and used the natural language uh, processing to extract events, or called quadruple, which means we extract actor, action, space, and time. Then we put into the GIS database for uh, a spatial event database. Then we listed all the selected events. Uh, then the um, historians can decide that uh, which events uh, will make sense to connect together to form narratives, and which events are may, may be out of the context. So in the listed selected events have a lot of historian intervention there to determine uh, what will be meaningful narratives to put into the spatial narrative database, and then they can query, analyze spatial narratives, and then and we can also uh, query, visualize, and analyze spatial events. And the more detailed from, uh, workflow is from the digital document. We look at, we tokenize the test. Wow, that's miserable. And so we tokenize the text. We look at one sentence at a time. And for each part of the text, we'll assign parts of speech, like it's verb or it's a noun or it's a spatial marker or temporal markers. So it will be something really messy like that. And then from that tokenized uh, the, the text, then we can identify spatial and temporal references. And Finally, we come out with event track tuple and then record information uh, in that format and then put it into the database and then present it in the map format and then display it in the table as well. And this is the interface um, for, uh, for the user. So they can decide that what are the verbs they are interested in uh, in the event database we uh, support it behind it, and then select a noun group, and this is the actor, and select a, a noun list. Uh, it could be, uh, I apologize that in the document, if it's doing civil war, so the slave is called Negro, and then they can, in this case, they want to find all the slaves run or escape from plantation, and then what are the data sources that they are interested in looking at. And then once the, they selected those events, then the system will list uh, the events on the interface. And then so they can look at what are the events of interest that they want to make connections to form narratives. And then once they choose the events, the system will save it into a spatial narrative form and then allow them to, uh, uh, to display that visually. And this is just another example that to choose different regiment as the entities to look at which regiment move a, uh, across uh, from different battles to different battles in the Dias Compendium. And then again, we can save that regiment's uh, uh, events into the narrative form and put into the database. Okay. And here just showed you that uh, we can have, uh, if we don't put in a particular verb or don't put in a particular noun list, they will just select all the events that with associate with that entity. And in this case, we choose uh, eight different entities that to look at how they move across. All right, so once we put into the GIS, uh, spatial narrative database, then we can looking at the spatial and temporal context of these actors and the events. 
Um, this, in this particular case, we look at uh, the highlighted actors, and that will be different regimens extracted from the Dias Compendium. And this looking at how, th how those regimens uh, occur in different parts of the United States. And we can looking at a particular regiment, in this case, a hundreds Illinois regiment infantry, over time, where they have been, and what, bat what battles they have been fighting, and then the, the movement of that particular regiment in the, uh, in the states. And then we were looking at, for a given place, who, who are the regiments have been here to, to, to fight? And the, so we select the place and then retrieve all the regiments that uh, have visited that location over time. Then we can also look at that who, the regiments that how they might have overlapping uh, battles in different locations. So this will be uh, the, I cannot see very well. So that 116, 100 Indiana regiment infantry have been working to, uh, with 101 Illinois infantry and 101 Indiana infantry, they have been together uh, at the locations and fighting battles. In this case, it would be in Savannah, Georgia. And we can also look at who are the infantry that they have co-action, means they're fighting battles together. And these are the locations they fight battles together. So, then I have had time to really show you the slave escape part, but I, I think that today, well, just to uh, introduce the idea that uh, have a lot of cyber resources in the text format, and it is possible that to extract in geographic information, in my case, as events and spatial, to form spatial narratives, but in this case, that GIS is not just a mapping platform, but GIS is the, a, a, a framework to help people build stories together from the historical resources. And but it doesn't have to be historical resources. It could be contemporary, uh, uh, like news wired, micro blogs, or uh, web pages. Uh, we, what we did is we uh, developed tools to automate the uh, ent entity recognition uh, and do georeferencing, and we develop a spatial database to store the events and narratives, and and then to uh, build tools to allow users to extract those events and query events from text and map it out in the and GIS platform. And. So a quick conclusion is that from tech, what we do is really from text to form events, then form narratives, and have spatial and temporal integration to elicit insight uh, from the text to event and event relation and to construct narratives. And the case study uh, I showed then is just a, a, a very small part of our work and we, uh, as the research progressed, even though it's ended, we found that there is even more interesting work that we, we can do follow this line of thinking um, to find out that uh, what happened to a place not necessarily have to be historical events. It could be uh, community events, it could be concerts and fairs, and what, what happens across space during a period of time uh, uh, what, what are the regiments have come into this place and what battle have been fighting in the place, whether they win or lose that b battle, or uh, wh how many concerts have happened in this pa place, uh, how many uh, uh, state fairs, how many movie theaters, how many show times, and so on and so forth. So what, what I'm here is that a lot of co-location, co-action information embedded in the test, if we do not uh, look at it in the different ways uh, rather than just reading the text document, it's really difficult to recognize. Uh, by putting that in the space-time framework uh, in GIS, it's much easier for us to uh, recognize co-location, co-action, 
and also the sequences of action across space and time. Um, I'm going to skip this because my time is up. Um, that uh, just a quick uh, statement is that we, we talk about time geography uh, quite a bit. A lot of people use time geography to record the GPS uh, tra trajectories. Um, but I think that it might be time to look at time geography to look, uh, to look at spatial narrative gen generation to really find a way to tell stories in a spatial way and so that we can uh, enrich our stories uh, in a much, to provide better appreciation of what have happened in geography. And what we have done here is really to combine text and analyst uh, and to, to, with GIS mapping and database spatial analysis uh, for this project. But we haven't yet really looking into event ontology to uh, different event types of certain events that we have to participate from beginning to the end, like going to a concert, but some events that we do not need to participate, we can just come in and out. Um, so what are different type of events and how different type of events when we put into spatial narrative will help us to interpret the, the, the richness of the place and the, to understand the, the people in that place. Um, and also for uh, the planning, like you go to a meeting, you have three hours to spare. What are the events that you can participate uh, uh, if we have the contemporary events recorded in the uh, GIS platform? And other issues that I haven't yet touched today is how to delineate a sequence of events so that can justify the imposition of narratives being beginning and end into a continuing, continuous empirical record. And for this, uh, for historians, this is very important uh, to know that how to start a story and how to end a story. And uh, space-time framework for narratives and analytical tools. Uh, we just touch on a little bit. We haven't yet really uh, formed a, a good systems to, to comprehensively look at narrative analysis. And for our project, uh, I'm working on the final report. So I really want to uh, look at the opportunities to build a re research agenda to continue this work. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the com comment and suggestions. In, in the spirit of the meeting, maybe we could parallel process and have the next panel start to set up because I think it's sitting down up front while we entertain questions or may entertain questions. Will that work? Steve, so, that work? Absolutely. Questions yeah, yeah. for May? Um, it, it's developing open source. We, we are in the process of putting out to the web. So we actually have a web prototype that uh, you can put your test in the, in the web prototype and then the system will uh, uh, extract the events and verbs uh, as you required. So, uh, but that web prototypes is not very, not very perform, doesn't perform well, uh, but it's there. It, uh, we have a lot to do to really make it more efficient. Other questions? Mary? May I just add that I'm still in the work of engaging. <laughs> Thank you. Very good, yes. <laughs> yes, oh, we, I forget to mention that we choose that two documents. 
Uh, one is newspaper articles, right? So they have reporting kind of genre. The other, the Dian's Companion is a very condensed, uh, all English. So yes, th that is a, a great challenge. The current natural language processing, the, the golden standard uh, corpuses are based on contemporary language, doesn't fit the all English. So we have to develop our own corpuses, and th I didn't report it, we did do that. Um, it, um, well, I'm not a native English speaker, but I do learn a lot of grammars <laughs> throughout this project in addition to American history. Um, in, in terms of the uh, place names recognition and georeference, that's another big challenge that we, we have gone a lot of efforts through it. The, the old place names, are not, a lot of them are not in the uh, existing gazetteers. So our solution is that we go out to the web, especially Wikipedia, to look at uh, civil, civil war uh, entries in the Wikipedia and then identify uh, to build our own gazetteer from uh, scrubbing the web and, and use that as a supplement to other gazetteers. Okay, it looks like we're ready to roll. Let's thank May, Mark, and Piotr for three excellent presentations. Thank Thanks. You.